Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me on the show again. This week, we're talking about disability. You know, we've all seen these videos that have been coming out for decades. The government or some high-tech company trots out a veteran with a missing arm or leg and says, ooh, look at this expensive robot arm we've built. Look at this exoskeleton. Now this poor soul can be a normal like you and me. And then the veteran lifts their robot arm and flexes their robot fingers. The crowd gives a standing ovation. And then we all go back to our normal lives, secure in the fact that this disability has been solved. Now, needless to say, this is a supremely fucked up way to present disability. These demos hide and ignore so much. I mean, you don't even hear a disabled person's voice in them unless it's to say, thank you so much, sir. They also avoid questions of cost and access. And worst of all, they present disability as a simple challenge to be simply fixed, to be wished away. But these demos don't present a solution at all. They just present a comforting fiction to those of us who don't yet face these problems. And here's the thing. Disability is not rare. 13% of all Americans are disabled. That's over 42 million people. And the older you get, the more likely it is. Live long enough and there's a very strong chance that you, yes, you, will become disabled. As you get older, your hearing, vision, mobility, and cognitive capacity are going to decline. And when these things do happen, you're not a heroic vet on a stage with a robot arm. You'll just be a regular person keeping up as best you can with a world that might make little accommodation for you. Some of you listening might be in that boat. I myself have been diagnosed with learning and visual disabilities. And I know that there is no magical solution. I just have to try and keep up. We live in a culture that seeks to hide and solve disability out of existence, and it's bullshit. And in order to change this culture, we first need to understand it. And our guest today is going to help us do that. She's going to help us reframe how we think about disability. She's an absolutely incredible thinker. Her name is Ashley Shu. She's a professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech who specializes in disability studies and technology ethics. And her new book is called Against Technoableism, Rethinking Who Needs Improvement. I know you're going to love this interview, but before we get to it, I just want to remind you that if you want to support this show, you can do so on Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode of the show ad free plus a bunch of other great community perks as well. We'd love to see you there. And if you love stand-up comedy, please come see me on tour this year. Coming up, I'm headed to Arlington, Virginia, right outside of D.C., Boston, Philadelphia, New York City, Chicago, Nashville, and Atlanta. Head to adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. And now, let's get to this interview with Ashley Shu. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you about disability and ableism. It's one of my favorite topics. It's been a little while since we've covered it on the show. You have a new book out called Against Techno-Ableism. I, I, I assume this is a word that you've coined. I love new words. What do you mean by this word? Uh, yeah, so techno-ableism is this word that I did coin. Thank you. Uh, but I don't think I'm describing anything like new if you're a disabled person. Like I'm describing something that lots of people are noticing, which is the mm -hmm. fact that if you're disabled, everything that is marketed to you is supposed to be life changing, right? Every single technology for disability that we hear about, even if it's not stuff that we're going to particularly want, is marketed as things that are going to fix us uh, change our world, make things so much more uh, like easy and better for us. And it suggests all the time that there's something really wrong with being just disabled and okay. Like it suggests mm. we always need intervention, um, even if we're just happily going along in our lives. And it makes disabled people always seem like, like we're calling out for help. Um, mm. um, in the way technologies are marketed um, thought up and described. And I think there are lots of people who are writing in this space. Um, there's some really great history written by J. Preet Verdi um, at University of Delaware about hearing devices throughout history. I don't end up talking a lot about hearing devices in the book because I think there's actually lots of great writing about hearing devices. Um, um, so I mentioned these things, um, but I, I look specifically at um, sort of devices aimed at walking um, so prosthetic devices mm. and exoskeletons. And then I look at different approaches um, to thinking about um, things like uh, neurodiversity and neurodivergent conditions and, and how we think through these often, often like reiterates a certain ableism in the approaches that we take. 
So let's uh, let's keep diving into that. Uh, what is the problem with some of these walking devices? Do you have a specific example of the mistake that is being made? Because it seems like it's something that would be very natural on its face. Someone can't walk. Oh, let's build a device to, to help, right? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of these devices are assume um, assume a lot about uh, a condition that very few people embody. So a lot of exoskeletons. Mm are posited on uh, paraplegic, quadriplegic bodies. Wait, can you describe what you mean by an exoskeleton and, and what oh, this yeah. sort of device so, might so, be? Um, so sort of like uh, um, something that you put your body in um, and it stands you up and helps you walk around. Um, some of these are highly computerized devices. Some of them are like more passive exoskeletons. Um, you know, there's actually some diversity within this space, but they all... They all see the answer to wheelchairs as exoskeletons, like that there's a problem mm. with using a wheelchair. And a lot of times the way that they are um, covered in media is um, to talk about now people don't have to use wheelchairs. When wheelchairs are actually a really great device that take people places. Yeah. Um, so it sort of denigrates a disability technology that already exists. And at the same time, it's aiming, you know, if it's aiming broadly at wheelchair users, many wheelchair users aren't using wheelchairs for issues of paralysis, um, right? There are plenty of people with POTS um, or with other um, issues where they where standing all the time is actually bad for them, right? We're standing, if you're, if you're someone with POTS and you stand up quickly, um, you might fall over and hit your head. And, you know, so you might be using a wheelchair not because your legs don't work and because it's impossible to stand, but standing for long periods of time can be painful for you too. Um, mm. or, or, you know, that, that, that when it's aiming at, if, if it is a replacement for a wheelchair, which is often how it's described, um, it's not doing that job, um, right? It's doing a very different thing. And the question, you know, for a lot of people who, for a lot of disabled people who are writing in this space is like, who is this really made for? Because particularly if you're looking at, um, I really love the blog um, that's called The Bad Cripple. Bill Peace, um, uh, who has since passed, um, wrote a lot about exoskeleton devices as a paraplegic man. And mm. talks about how if, you know, if science and engineering want to invest in research for, for people like him, um, that they would be at, better off talking about bowel and bladder health. Um, to work on issues about pressure sores, right? The things that end up being uh, much larger challenges um, in a person's life that, than walking. Um, um, you know, that there are all these other things that, that call for more attention that no one wants to talk about or pay attention to because they're not as glamorous, right? You can't get your big engineering team and those photo ops um, on something related to bladder health quite as easily. Um, that doesn't play in the media quite as well. So we get these stories that sort of glorify big engineering teams taking on these humanitarian goals of helping people walk again. But the question is like, who are they helping? And the second thing is like, they often show real ignorance about the experience of disability. So at one point um, on the West Coast, there was this great um, disabled um, hackathon where um, um, a Corbett O'Toole was one of the disabled activists who was involved in it. Um, and it was about like really centering disabled people's needs. And um, it was, you know, participate, like it was a mostly disabled team. And like the thing that they decided that they were going to work on um, you know, the thing after the discussion, what, what was the greatest need in the community? Um, it was a lift to get female wheelchair users onto toilets so that they could toilet themselves, right? That, uh -huh. was, that was the request. Like, 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 like let, the word, let, let's come up with this, you know, open source device that anyone could, could build that helps people get into a toilet. And so yeah. at one point I had an exoskeleton, like I teach a class on technology and disability. And I, just, I just had a picture of an exoskeleton and we had been reading from different disabled people. And the picture was up on the projector. And one of the students in the class was just looking like dumbfounded at this. And they say, how does a person go to the bathroom in an exoskeleton? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer and the answer for the exoskeleton that we were looking at, and it was one that had been produced commercially, um, um, the answer was the person is going to have to go take off the exoskeleton, sit back in their wheelchair, wheel themselves into the bathroom, put themselves on the toilet, get themselves off the toilet, get back to the exoskeleton <laughs> and put it on. Right. Obviously, people hadn't thought about 
you know, walking around is great, but what do you want to do when you're walking around? And, <laughs> like it was an advantage, right? You couldn't you couldn't do a basic human task. And meanwhile, the actual folks who are wheelchair users are saying, hey, what I really need is the the part where I get into the toilet. That's the actual problem in my day. Um, uh, so what do you mean when you say that these devices are made for like, who are they for? Right. Uh, I, the implication that you're making is that they're for the people who invented them or who are developing them in some way. And could you expand on that a little bit? Well, I mean, if you're Bill Peace and he's not the only one to observe this, um, you have to look at who these devices are being funded by. And a lot mm. of exoskeletons are being funded by the Department of Defense or DARPA. Um, ah. And Bill Peace would tell you that this is really some sort of humanitarian cover for what is building super soldiers. So actually, like a lot of times the disabled people like, oh, this is a nice story that sort of covers up what the ultimate goals of a technology are. Right. It's a way for the engineers on the team can to feel good about a project that maybe we shouldn't be feeling that good about. Mm. It also, I mean, so much of the time, and I talked in the intro about these tech demos I've seen my entire life about like, look, we've built a prosthetic arm for veterans who have lost an arm, you know, or whatever. And the question that is never asked in those demos is, why is this person missing an arm? You know, like this person's a veteran, right? <laughs> they they have suffered a uh, an injury, uh, a disabling injury, Maybe that's the maybe we could look at <laughs> that end of the problem. You know what I mean? Rather than have you know DARPA funded, uh, you know high tech fixes. Uh, there's there's always sort of a question missing there. Yeah, and I so there are a lot fewer arm amputees than there are leg amputees, but there mm. are, are a ton of projects related to the creation of arms, and part mm. of the reason is. Um, I mean, because most amputees are leg amputees, you can actually get better prosthetic legs. Like the field is more advanced when it comes to prosthetic legs. Like they have more people to try them on, right? Um, um, yeah. um, but when it comes to prosthetic like hand devices, there's also a lot of people who want to like DIY and 3D print. And the thing is, if your hand fails, you drop something, right? Or it falls off or, or something like that. But if your prosthetic leg fails, you're t you're breaking a hip, right? They're right. like like they sort of like what is fun to play around with in the lab doesn't always translate to what's useful to people, right? I think about a lot of these projects as being like fun for engineers to think about um, and to think about themselves as being humanitarian in this work, but often it's really divorced from any engagement with disabled people ourselves. And I spend a, a nice portion of one of my chapters talking about why a lot of hand amputees, arm amputees don't end up wearing hands or arms. Um, I mean, part of that is insurance. You're much more likely to get coverage in the United States uh, for um, a prosthetic leg. There's also a lot less legs need to do, right? So my leg, I need to stand, I need to sit. I, I don't care about running. Running's terrible, um, right? Like, like, like there's the, a couple of things that, <laughs> that my leg needs to do. Hands do lots more things than legs do, uh, right? Yeah. So the sort of like, Finding a good replacement for this thing that does so many other things is actually like a, like a design issue. But then then there's yeah. also like a lot of people like adapt and learn, use lots of different tools, right? You have the cutting boards with spikes that you like slam uh, something onto so that then you just cut with your other hand, right? Um, and yeah. lots of people, there are more congenital arm amputees than leg amputees. So a lot of people have their arm amputations, um, limb difference uh, from birth. Um, and that means that a lot of times they adapt and know how to do a whole bunch of stuff that if you are a new arm amputee, um, you need to pay attention and watch what they're doing um, so you can can <laughs> learn. But a lot of disabled people adapt to what they have. That means we also adapt to the yeah. tools that we're given. And sometimes you have people who are using like really old timey throwback tools because that was what was what, what they got when they were young and that's what they mastered. <laughs> um, um, so that there's, there's really a wide realm. And a lot of times uh, disabled people are really like stereotyped. Right. Like, oh, mm. if you're an amputee, you're going to need X. And that's not necessarily true. Like we can make lots of different choices. But a lot of the ways these technologies are marketed and understood, like really suggest that there's like a one to one matchup between different technologies and disabled and different disability types that I don't think really exists. Like the things that we exchange in community, the tips and tricks um, often end up like having cross applications in ways that the people who are designing for us without any of our input. Um, 
like really fail to account for? Yeah, it it seems that the the people who are making this technology and by the way, I'm sure there's people who are doing a better version of what you're talking about uh, out there. But we're talking about the people who are making the mistake. Right. And those who are making the mistake are it almost seems as though they're fantasizing about what disabled people need. They're looking at a disabled person saying, ah, this person can't walk. This person is missing an arm. This person can't see that. I would feel bad if that was me. What what they need is some device that turns them back into me. They need a prosthetic that like exactly duplicates the hand. Um, they're making a very sort of basic assumption, which is maybe very natural if you have that level of ignorance, but um, it's like a, a really strong assumption about what is actually needed, uh, which is, as you say, to fix the person, right? Can we talk more about that assumption? Like, where does that come from? Oh, I mean, ableism is pretty deeply embedded in everything. Um, it's like, actually yeah, this is the root of ableism. Is this, yeah. Um, um, yeah. And, you know, so when I talk about ableism in my classes, I, I, I like to say that ableism is the sauce we're all marinated in. Like mm. disabled people also like experience lateral ableism, internalized ableism. Like it's not like we're born free um, um, from the sort of prejudice that like exists all around us about other types of disability, um, about um, sort of, you know, and a lot of these things are reiterated in school environments. Um, a lot of these things are reiterated in medical environments, but but even regular social interaction. Um, you know, we've been taught to devalue um, disabled testimony, disabled voices. And so many of our stories about disability, um, A, when they have any disabled people at all, right? And keep in mind, like disabled people constitute like 15 to 20 percent of the population, right, at any yeah. given time. And the dearth of stories about disabled people is is alarming. Like just to be regular like side characters or main characters and the, who happen to be disabled is is so rare. And even when we have disabled characters who are written, it's usually for like a very special episode um, of something. Um, or it is, you know, it often falls into one of a number of tropes. I have a chapter on different tropes about disability um, um, in this book because even when we think we're doing what's best for disabled people, um, often that's really been informed by uh, media representation that's really very skewed about um, what disabled people need and sort of disabled people's relationships with non-disabled people, right? As sort of like always calling out for need, but everyone has needs, right? Um, everyone, yeah. um, um, you know, experiences um, a lot of the things disabled people too, but disabled people are really like exceptionalized, stigmatized, um, and, you know, often are encouraged to pass as well as possible. Right. To downplay any disability. And so like there are so many tropes that like really revolve around overcoming disability, where overcoming disability means being less disabled. Right. There's there's it's wound up with with um, sort of anti-immigration sentiment, the way people are um, mm. um, discussed. It's bound up with white supremacy. Um, so sort of like the sort of way in which we value different people and groups of people often is like legitimated based on sort of anti-disability um, tropes. So we have a whole history of like IQ testing um, that, yeah. you know, white European men do better on IQ testing. Um, um, you know, <laughs> surprise, they wrote the tests. Um, um, there's a whole history of that being like weaponized and used to like justify, well, we want immigrants from these places, but not these. Right. Yeah. And that is based on like sort of ideas about intelligence that aren't actually very real to the world. Um, there's a long history of like using BMI in this way, too. Mm -hmm. um, um, and one that I feel like is very much ongoing for both of these things. When you say that 15% uh, uh, of people are disabled, um, it raises the question for me of, of who identifies themselves as disabled, you know, how are we even making that categorization? I mean, I spoke a number of years ago on an older version of this podcast with, with Judith Human before she passed away. And, and it was a really revelatory conversation for me, um, obviously, a uh, legendary uh, disability rights activist, for those who don't know, please go back and listen to that episode if you haven't heard it. Uh, but, you know, she made me confront the fact that I don't think of myself as disabled, yet I have a vision impairment. 
uh, that's that's very serious. That's part of why I don't drive. Um, I have a learning. I have ADD. I have a learning disability. Um, uh, maybe those things combined are why I don't really feel comfortable driving, along with the fact that I I hate cars and car culture. But you know, there's there. But uh, you know, I but I you know I'm not. I don't have dis, you know, disabled in my Twitter bio. Right. Um, and she, she also pointed out, this is the, you know, one of the identities that almost everybody will join as you age, right. As you age, you will, you are likely to become disabled. Um, and you know, I have a complicated relationship with that. Cause I'm like, okay, well I'm not medicated anymore for the ADD, but I get along fine. You know, I have my coping mechanisms. I, I have, you know, lenses obviously for my eyes, um, et cetera. Uh, and so it may, you know, when I start thinking about that, um, it makes me confront like, okay, what is my relationship with disability? And then what is everybody else's? And is that 15% potentially a lot larger? And is the reason it isn't is because of ableism overall. So that's my, what I'm coming to it with. I would love to hear your, your thoughts on any of what I just said. <laughs> uh, I mean, I do feel sometimes like I'm always recruiting disabled people because you go over that and I'm like, you're disabled, um, you know, c come sit with us. Um, um, yeah. But there's like so many ways in which, um, you know, I don't necessarily need everyone to pipe up and say I'm disabled. But I, I do think that there's something really powerful in thinking about yourself as part of a disability community. Right. I think mm -hmm. about all the things like I have chemo brain. It quacks a lot like ADHD. I talk about that in the mm. book, too, um, um, where I am listening in anytime any of my friends with ADHD is speaking about their disability. I am leaning in to get whatever tips and tricks they are using to try out in my own life. Right. Like I, I know that these are the people like this. This is the neurotype I need to pay attention to, um, you know, and and. and, and I think there's a difference, you know, also in talking about sort of impairment and disability. I think when we adjust, um, we don't always experience our disabilities as impairments, right? I, I don't think that's true in all cases, but I think about this a lot with chemo brain. Like I have brain damage from chemotherapy. Like that's not something I'm, I'm getting out of. Um, that That's like the state of things. I had chemotherapy 10 years ago, right? It's not It's not getting better. Um, um, you know, they always tell you after you finish chemo, oh, let's just wait a year and see if you are still experiencing this symptom. Um, yeah. Um, and I was and am and will continue to. But, and you know, my first few years, it was awful, right? Because I hadn't, hadn't figured out how to, how to manage this thing. Um, mm -hmm. so my friend, um, Liz Bengola, um, who was in disability community with me on campus and we did like, you know, different disability advocacy in our community. Um, you know, every time she would talk and say things that she was doing, I was like, oh, oh yeah. And so all of a sudden I'm programming the time my kids need to get picked up from school into my phone. Right. I'm doing what Liz does. Right. She programs all these things into her phone by day of the week so that she shows up places on time and doesn't leave her kids at school. Actually, did she didn't have kids, um, but um, she doesn't have kids. But um, um, I, I could imagine like how I could use what she was talking about. Um, and I don't experience my chemo brain as impairment in the way that I did. Right. I have different fixes. Right. And some of them are technological. Like I'm using my phone. It's not a specific app for disability. Uh, but it is using it for a disability purpose. And I find like the things that we exchange in community are often much more powerful. Um, you know, there's also, you know, people with ADHD. I mean, they have options in terms of medication, but there's also, um, um, what is it? It's called body doubling, where you schedule time for a friend to come over so that you can complete a chore. Your friend doesn't help you with that chore, but having someone there and you saying, hey, I'm going to complete <laughs> this chore means that you're going to do the chore. Um, you know, sometimes we do writing group, writing groups, because I'm, you know, in an academic environment and we all need to do writing and it's impossible to sit by yourself yes. and write. If you're sitting I, with I, your friends, you're getting a lot more writing done because you said you would. And like the peer pressure of that produces. Yeah. I write so much better when I'm writing with another person. That's why, you know, if I'm working in a writer's room or with another writer in my comedy writing, um, it goes much better because we are, you know, fo it helps me focus. And when I get distracted, the other person can pick up the slack a little bit. Whereas solo writing, I experience, you know, as kind of hell. <laughs> I mean, and so do so do people who don't have ADD. I think writing is one of the worst tasks anyone can ever do. Um, but it is I, I you know, I, I 
It's funny because I have not thought about that as an ADD coping strategy. Um, and yet now I'm realizing that it is. Uh, and so I, I just find it interesting though. I'm sure I, I have plenty of ableism, right? That I'm, I'm a very functional person in my life. Um, I treasure all the things that I can do. I'm very proud of them. And I know that I have a bit of a fear of, you know, being, uh, you know, like losing ability. Right. Um, and I also sort of recognize, oh, that might cause me to sort of push down these other things as me conceiving of them as disability, uh, which is, you know, I'm sort of, oh no, that's not me. That's not me. Ah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a regular, you know what I mean? I can do whatever. Um, and that's, uh, I, I think that's part of the entire psychological problem that you're talking about. Um, that, that leads people to make this error, um, is conceiving of themselves as separate from truly disabled people. Is that, is that making sense? Yeah. And I think a lot of disabilities are really zigzaggy variable yeah. and a lot of our representations of disability are really static. Right. So we don't have a lot of representations where some days you get up and you're fully functional and the next day you have to stay in bed or, you know, you have a pain flare or your Crohn's disease or autoimmune condition is all of a sudden upon you. And you might need accommodations today when you didn't yesterday. Like we don't actually have very many representations where a person's sort of um, like experience of their disability varies over time. We have the sort of dramatic, they become disabled, right? Um, um, or are cured and it's like blinking in and out. But the sort of long-term variable disability, which is a lot of disabilities, like even if you have something like I, you know, I'm an amputee. Some days, some days everything's going well and my leg fits well and I'm walking around like the normals and all those, you know, two, two legged assholes out there. I'm just like them. Um, and then like the next day <laughs> I, I like I ate too much salt because I flew too close to the sun and all of a sudden I can't fit my prosthesis on or it's tight and it's uncomfortable or because I had such fun yesterday, like I have some metal in my hip. Right. And all of a sudden my hip aches, um, you know, like I am like it's the same disability. Right. And I say, oh, I'm an amputee. Sometimes I get hip pain, um, but I don't always have hip pain. Right. There's there's this sort of like even if I'm experiencing something that people think about is really static. Right. I have a particular yeah. like level of amputation and that's not really going to change unless if unless if I get a pressure sore and I have to get a re they call it a revision when you need a second amputation above your original amputation site, which is just such like whenever I go to do revisions on a document now, like I'm haunted by this particular <laughs> idea, um, like you were just going to cut further up um, and we can get it right this time. Um, you know, so, so, so like, but, but like, you know, sometimes amputees also become more amputee, like in some way, like an additional wow. badge um, on there. But like in general, like this is static and it's unchanging, but it also like that doesn't mean my status around it like is always the same. So I think like especially for when we're talking about things like ADHD, um, you know, most people experience that in a zigzaggy kind of way. Yeah. Right. And so it's really hard. I know like it's really hard for people to ask for accommodations because you say, well, I can do this sometimes. <laughs> right. And that's, that's a little <laughs> internalized ableism. You're like, well, I can do it sometimes. So I don't need that help. Right. When it's, yeah, when, and and know. therefore, the one time I can't do it, it's my own fault. Right. Yeah. And then then you can, you know, push that back on yourself. And I, I feel like mm -hmm. we just we need more representations where disability is like zigzagging more. And, and we also do this thing where we, um, you know, if you've done it once, you should be able to do it again. And that's not true yeah. all the time. Right. Um, you know, with yeah. different like levels of fatigue, different situations in your life, you might not be able to do the same thing that you did before or in the same way you used to. And and we have such a, like we, a lot of people really want to police disability, right? I, I see this yeah. around disabled parking on a regular basis. Um, I've had to explain, um, at one point someone was complaining to me that everyone took all the disabled spots dur during a rainstorm and they were just being lazy and didn't want to get rained on. And I'd just like to suggest as someone who experiences hip pain related to weather that sometimes people are walking further because they can walk further on a given day. But a lot of times with weather related pressure changes, a whole bunch of people who have arthritis, um, who have different metal implants in their body are ex like they're experiencing the weather different. Um, they're experiencing yeah. it in a bot embodied way and they're going to need disability parking. 
Like they probably don't need it all the time, right? If they're not regularly parking there. And and so disability parking gets really crowded um, on rainy days. But I don't doubt that all those people are disabled, right? Um, there's, yeah. there's always, there's people who want to also rank which disabilities matter more than others. Uh, we, we see <laughs> like, we see a lot of lateral ableism, ableism even within disability community where, you know, um, some disabilities are like more stigmatized or even seen as less valid. Do you have a do you have a general example of that without, you know, calling anybody out? Yeah. So so lateral ableism um, is something, you know, when I see and this is the, the sort of the classic version of this is someone who's physically disabled saying, well, it, you know, but it doesn't affect my mind with the suggestion mm. that. In fact, um, like they are ranked higher um, somehow than people who have uh, disabilities that affect their cognition in some way. And it's kind of right. shitty to do to other people um, because, you know, I don't think any of these hierarchies make sense like like in a, an enduring kind of way. Right. We'll have different yeah. needs. It's OK that we have different needs. Right. That doesn't mean yeah. that your disability counts more than mine does. Right. If I'm an arm amputee. Disability parking is probably not going to help me like like it's not going to like even the the playing field, <laughs> like in terms of like my energy in a given day. Right. So yeah. our amputees generally don't have disability uh, placards. And that makes sense. Uh, but for people who have trouble walking long distances or um, who get out of breath really easily. Um, so people with COPD um, um, and that kind of thing, like having disability parking can mean the difference between being there or not. Um, yeah. um, and that is, you know, they just have different needs. It's not that one counts more than the other. Well, uh, that brings a question to mind for me, uh, that really cuts to the core of the definition of disability that I'd love you to answer. But before we get to it, we have to take a quick, a quick break. So we'll be right back with more Ashley Shu. I think that was a pretty good, uh, tease for the second half of the show. Uh, I, I hope you agree. <laughs> Hey folks, because I'm such a big believer in internet privacy and security, it won't surprise you to learn that I use a virtual private network. That kind of security is just too important to overlook in the age of online personal data. Many of you might use a VPN already, but others might have heard of VPNs but not known where to start. Well, the time is now to make a jump to NordVPN as they're offering an exclusive deal to Factually listeners. NordVPN shields your IP address and secures your online traffic with state-of-the-art encryption. That means that at home or on the go, if you hop on public Wi-Fi, you can rest assured that your online traffic is protected. My personal favorite feature is the ability to change your virtual location. So if you're traveling abroad and you want to stream your favorite shows that are only available back home in the U.S., well, wherever you might be, you just choose the little flag icon for U.S., Canada, U.K., Germany, or dozens of other places to change where your connection is coming from. NordVPN also includes dark web monitoring to determine whether if any of your passwords have been compromised. One quick look will tell you where your passwords and usernames might have been compromised so you can secure accounts before it becomes a problem. NordVPN is simple to set up, even simpler to use, and this is simply the best time to try it out. So head to nordvpn.com slash Adam Conover to get this exclusive deal right now and join me using a VPN. That's nordvpn.com slash Adam Conover. You know, if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, you know how much I love Delete Me. In a world where our personal data is being sold and traded online by data brokers, it's invaluable to have someone in your corner to make sure you're staying as safe as possible. Here's the deal. Your email address, phone number, and home address is being sucked up by data brokers, and they are offering it for sale out there on the internet to anybody who wants it without you even knowing it. And these services have opt-outs where, you know, you can send in your ID and prove who you are to get your data taken down. But guess what? There's hundreds of them. You can't possibly do that all by yourself. There's no way you can keep up with it. That is why you need Delete Me. See, Delete Me's teams of experts scans the internet to find where your data is on these data broker sites. They give you a detailed report of their findings and they submit the opt outs for you and get all that information taken down. I have used this service for years. It is an absolutely invaluable part of keeping me and my loved ones safe online. I've signed up for memberships for all of my family members just because I don't want anybody hunting down, you know, uh, any of my loved ones to harass them. And we live in an era of doxing online harassment and ID theft 
that can compromise not just your finances, but ruin job opportunities and just be a huge hassle. I mean, 41% of Americans are exposed to some form of online harassment and that might be you. So if you wanna safeguard yourself and live with the peace of mind that experts are hunting down and removing your personal information from all these sites every three months, then check out Delete Me. Go to joindeleteme.com slash Adam and get 20% off for all consumer plans with the code Adam. That's joindeleteme.com slash Adam to get 20% off. Do it. Uh, we're back with Ashley Shu. Um, so we were talking about, you know, ableism generally, uh, how different disabilities affect people differently. But something that I've been rolling around in my mind for a while is it isn't the definition of disability somehow bound up in the world that we live in, right? Because uh, if you are able to do something versus not able to do something, that can be because of the built environment around you or the accommodations that are that are given to you. Someone who is, uh, you know, has a difficulty reaching very high, well, if there are no things on high shelves, they are not necessarily impaired vis-a-vis -vis that, you know, particular task, right? Um, or, you know, I have a friend who's a, a dear friend who's a wheelchair user and, you know, the right curb cuts make all the difference, right? In terms of his ability to get around. Um, and when I think about my own disabilities, why I don't often think of them as such, it's because, well, in most of the case, in most cases, you know, I, well, I have corrective lenses and I have other ways I can get around, et cetera. Um, is that, is that not a big piece of the puzzle? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think you're sort of alluding to the social model of disability, right? That we're more am, disabled yeah. by sort of the built environment and sort of like people's like preconceived notions, like in our social world. So social mm -hmm. barriers, but infrastructural barriers that sort of impact like who who is experiencing the world differently or in an alternative fashion than 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 the other people around them. Um, and I think there's you know, I, I talk a little bit about the social model and I, I love the social model. I don't think there's like one overriding model for disability that we're all going to agree on and that will be satisfying for every type of disability. But I like mm -hmm. the social model because it gives us things to work on. Right. Um, um, and it suggests yes. that it's not all up to the individual, um, that there are lots of ways in which you can negotiate space and change different attitudinal barriers um, um, so that you can make progress towards disability inclusion. You know, I think even if everything were set up in the most inclusive way possible, you will still have people who experience long term pain. Right. You will still yeah. have, um, you know, people who cannot work um, um, a sort of like regular work day. Um, um, you will still like, even if we have like very modified sort of work days, which we should, um, a very flexible time, which we ought to, um, you're, you're st still going to have people who are, are outliers in some sense. So I like the social model because sort of like we get ideas about universal design. Like we like revise the world in a particular way. More bodies can exist comfortably. If we make flexible schedules, if we use universal design for learning to include more people in classrooms and make it easy to turn in assignments and do a lot less like bullshit in terms of like like the barriers towards entrance like oh you have to put things in this font in this you know like there's so many like small things that people require in education that just seem completely um, worthless to me um you know if we set all of these things, and we give the notes ahead of time and and like even if we did all of those things i think you will still have people who experience um uh, particularly painful conditions um and and like energy related um, disabilities that, that, you know, they'll be better included, uh, but it's not gonna, you know, take everything away. So I, I do see that there are lots of shortcomings to the social model, but I think it's really useful for political action. Um, yeah. and to sort of think about technology too, because as a disabled person encountering the world, you know, yes, I'm wearing some of the technologies, um, that, that I'd like to take advantage of. Some of them work better than others. And I think we also forget that, a lot of disability technologies require a lot of maintenance and care and a lot of work on the part of the disabled person to use them. But I also want to have a world in where, where you know, I, I should be able to exist in several formats, right? If I want to use a wheelchair on a given day because of different issues I'm having, I should be able to switch, right? And, and, and not have a problem. My friend Mallory K. Nelson talks about this idea of trans mobility. And it's a really lovely idea. Um, and she's my, one of my fellow amputees. 
Um, she's multiply disabled as well, just like you are too. Um, I'll, I'll hit on that in a moment. Uh, but but she talks about how we actually have more choices in terms of how we move about in the world than non-disabled people do. So if you're a leg amputee like she and I are, um, you might use forearm crutches. You could use a wheelchair. You could use a prosthetic leg. You could use a combination yeah. of these devices and you can appear in different formats at different times. And it might not say anything like about you or what you believe about yourself that you are appearing in that embodiment like on a particular day. So she switches a lot between her wheelchair and crutches um, and her forearm crutches. She can go so fast on them. She can go downstairs on those. Like I, I love watching her on those bad boys. Um, they like she's an amazing <laughs> crutch user. Um, and I, you know, I met her when I was a fairly like new amputee and she had been one for like two decades at that point. And I was just so impressed uh, with her skills. Um, but she moves really fluidly. And like a lot of her choice is about um, like what she plans to do that day. Is she going to go a really long distance? Well, then she's using her wheelchair and then she has like a special right. thing that she tucks her her crutches into her wheelchair um, um, that had to be hacked by someone. Like that was not a standard wheelchair thing to have your crutches click right into your wheelchair. But at some point um, she got someone to put on what I think is a... Uh, like a holder for brooms, um, which is the perfect size for her crutch um, um, uh, that she got to like s drill into her wheelchair and screw onto the side. And it works great as a hack. That's not something they offer because they, they only expect one form of mobility. Insurance will pay for one thing. Right. And this is like a really real impediment. Like I have to decide what my embodiment is going to be for the rest of, right. you know, for until, until I can afford a new device. And some of these, like, like we're talking wheelchair, that's custom. Right. Um, you want something if you're using it all the time. Um, you know, she went back and forth with her insurance for a long time because they were willing to pay for a prosthetic leg. And she is um, a hemipelvectomy, meaning half of her pelvis. Like she's she's the highest level. Um, I love that we call it highest level because it sounds like she's a <laughs> wizard. Right. Um, she's reached the highest <laughs> level of um, leg amputee. Uh, but it means like she would need a hip joint, a knee joint, an ankle. Right. Those are those are the expensive pieces on on a prosthetic limb. Um, yeah. Her insurance would have paid for over a hundred thousand dollars of leg equipment, but they would not pay. She didn't want the leg because, um, of course, it's very high up and there's not a lot to hang that prosthetic limb on once you have that high of an amputation. Right. So mm -hmm. there's like a cost to wear um, and it's very heavy, hard to move in. Um, she wanted to get um, forearm crutches with like shock absorption. That would really help her preserve her rotator cuffs, her her wrists, and all of this. Um, so a thousand dollars for a pair of forearm crutches, and she was like, "Hey, insurance, could you pay for these forearm crutches? I do not want the prosthetic leg. I would like this other thing that has more value to me, even though it's like one percent of the cost." And insurance said, "Really? Insurance says no." Uh, uh, because they and won't why, pay for more expensive would, forearm crutches. They will like, pay for your basic level forearm crutch, which is like eighty dollars. And, and why why would they rather pay a hundred thousand dollars for a high tech solution than a thousand dollars for a forearm crutch? Like, I, obviously, there's some bureaucratic problem. If you ask anybody at the company, they would get it. But there's some policy choice being made further upstream. And so, what is this? You know, what is the source of this obsession with this sort of high tech fix? Well, I mean, I think about this as, um, you know, if you're an amputee, a leg amputee, people really want to see you walking and standing because almost mm -hmm. every amputee that they've seen is, and, and scare quotes here, overcoming their disability with technology. Like we're being sold a story about technology as well as a story mm. about disability, right? We're being told... Um, you know, if if there isn't yet a fix for you, you should be investing, probably asking a venture capitalist <laughs> to invest um, um, <laughs> in technology that will fix you one day. So there's like a strong preference, like even when you go out socially as an amputee, for mm -hmm. you to wear your leg among other people you run into, right? I have a friend who's been like regularly quizzed in a grocery store because he wasn't wearing a prosthetic leg. Right. Um, um, you know, if he appears without it, um, he was scrutinized in his small in his small town. Like, why are you? Why don't you have your leg on? You know, and essentially implying that he wasn't trying hard enough if he didn't yeah. if he didn't give the technology time. 
or somehow inconveniencing the other people by appearing without the prosthetic leg, which made them more comfortable. Well, and perhaps. He, he wasn't asking for any sort of he's just picking out groceries like like there's yeah. there's it. And, you know, some amputees get told that they're indecent for not wearing their legs in public. How right? dare you yeah. be disabled in front of us? How dare you be visibly disabled and not trying to look otherwise right not trying to pass yeah. and sometimes pass is a functional pass not a like visible pass but there is like a huge a huge emphasis on walking and in ways that are really toxic so i think about this in terms of sort of amputee communities at one point i was trying to join the amputee support group in the adjacent community to mine because my community didn't have one then um and i i had left a message with the woman who ran the group and she called me up and i was you know, I was not even a year out of my amputation and my, I have a really rare type of amputation. That's probably too hard to explain at the moment. Um, but like I had to wait for my bones to fuse before I could bear full weight. Right. So I had to use crutches and my prosthetic leg for like, a, like 11 months after my surgery, wow. I was using crutches still. And then I dropped down to one crutch and then eventually, um, to a cane, um, cause I was on chemotherapy. Like my body was not healing at all. Um, oh. um, um, it was, it was bad. Um, but she was like quizzing me and I just like dropped down to using the cane and she gave me, like, she asked me all of these questions about my gait, about how well I walked. Like her first question is, are you using a prosthesis? How well are you walking? Have you dropped, like, you're not using anything else? Just the, and of course I was still using my cane. Um, and I remember like her saying at the end of the conversation that there were two old guys in the group who who wouldn't even try wearing legs and maybe it would be a kick in the pants to them to have me show up to this group i did not show up i'm not here to shame people into wearing their legs <laughs> like like the whole idea that the reason that and, I and was this was in the amputee support group that you were getting oh, this oh no it was the amputee support group and i'm encountering wow. this like gatekeeper um to the amputee support group who wants to make sure like that i'm going to be like a good question mark influence and the thing is i met these guys a couple years later because they were like friends from the same region i put it together they were part of this support group and the thing is you're like these were the guys i met yeah. the guys and they they were great i met them their wives they they do a lot of road trips and camping together like they are disabled friends who had like who they're, they were <laughs> chuckleheads. We had a great time. They're living their best lives uh, with no prostheses. and they they're not using the, yeah they're not using prostheses at all um but but that wasn't like limiting their lives in any way. They were going on more adventures than I was um, when I met them at the amputee um, coalition meeting that that I ran into them at and like connected the dots that these were the people that this woman was going to bring me into shame. And it just struck <laughs> me as so absurd that we would do that level of like insisting how other people's bodies should be and then like yeah. trying to set up other disabled people against each other um, in ways that are really toxic and ugly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when it comes to technology, because this, again, is the subject of your book. And thank you so much for for talking about every dimension of of disability. Um, but how do we tell the difference between, you know, when we're looking at a new technology, a good technology and a bad technology? Because obviously corrective lenses, for instance, are, uh, I think, pretty pretty unequivocally good. Right. For for sight impairment, very simple technology. But there's others, you know, an exoskeleton that doesn't let you pee, maybe bad. <laughs> so, so what is the, what is the distinction for you? I mean, a lot of it has to do with the desires of disabled people in community with each other. Um, mm. You know, I want multiple ways to be in the world. Like, I think one of the problems with like how we set up technology and disability is that we're getting this story about disability wrong all the time because we have all these tropes and we like want to force things to fit particular molds. And this is like longstanding. I, I love this one quote from Harriet McBride Johnson in her book, Accidents of Nature, which is about disabled kids at disabled summer camp. And two of the girls are talking to each other. And one says like she wishes there was just one story in the Bible where the crypt didn't get cured so that she could just mm. be and be disabled and not have people try to intervene. Right. Uh, so I think we've wedded a lot of these stories where disabled people like the call out for intervention or need to be overcoming or like there's there's a couple of these tropes that that have like a long history here. And I think we wed that with like real optimistic ideas about what technology can do for us. And this is where I think disability being so exceptionalized and abnormalized is really a problem. 
Because, yeah. you know, as we may have experienced in trying to set up this particular audio situation, um, you know, um, it took us 25 <laughs> for minutes, those, everybody. For those who were not, well, nobody heard this because it happened before the podcast. It took us a good half hour to get audio set up uh, for this podcast, which we're recording remotely, very common problem, but it was a little tricky today. It was. And, you know, it's complicated by the fact that I have like Bluetooth hearing aids on. Like I'm not, I don't reject technology, right? Um, but I think yeah. we tend to like idealize technology for disability, right? Because we've exceptionalized and abnormalized disability. Technology for disability always has to be wonderful. We can never just have incremental changes, right? Where the material, yeah. like I really like material, like the material history of prosthetic devices is really interesting, right? But sometimes mm. better materials are just better materials. It's not life changing for me, right? It's just better. Um, um, and a lot of times that we cover over um, sort of issues of like maintenance and wear. And there are lots of uh, people like... Um, um, Josh Earl, who's talking about cyborg maintenance as a regular theme, like disabled people are regularly having to think about how to repair these technologies, how to negotiate, like when things are out of warranty, how to deal with systems that don't want to give us stuff. Like, I feel like when we're describing technology for disability, we think it's going to be a quick and easy fix because that's what people want. But if you've ever experienced technology as a human being, <laughs> it's never as clean yeah. and as perfect as the manufacturer promised it would be. And I think we lose out on how normal technology is for disabled people too, and normal in the way that it plays out in the same patterns as it does in everyone else's life, where you get a new operating system on your computer and it is the worst day of your life because everything yeah. is in, everything's in the wrong place. Um, and it's intensified. Oh it's intensified. Uh -huh. If you're someone who uses you know screen reading software and you get an update, all of a sudden, like basic technologies that you used in your life are gone. Right. And we yeah. forget that all of these things require constant monitoring, constant wear, um, you know, that these are things we wear close to our bodies or close at hand, um, you know, when we talk about different apps and things like that. And I think when we're always praising technology for disability, we tend not to see the technologies for what they are. Mm. And what what are they? <laughs> Is that too general of a question? Like we tend to not see them for what they are. That made me want to go. No, what the I hell mean, are they, though? I, so I'm I'm from philosophy of technology. So you ask me what are they when it comes to technology, and we could be here for like, <laughs> you know, several centuries. But I I think there's a fundamental like technology is no one thing, right? Technologies yeah. ideally are tools that help us get things done. Sometimes they can change our lives, sure, but most of the time they're just changing how we do things, not what we do, right? And I I feel like a lot of our stories about disability technology like suggests that if we just got the technology right, that disability wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Or it ceased to exist. Or it ceased to exist. Um, and there are so many movements, you know, when I think about all of the science fiction that writes disabled people out of the future, right? That's uh -huh. not a realistic vision. Like the future is going to be more disabled, not less. Climate change is coming. More people are yeah. going to have, you know, when we talk about pollution and rates of asthma and different types of cancers. Um, you know, even if we got off planet, like, Space is disabling. It is not our environmental niche. It will hurt our bodies. It'll probably yeah. hurt our minds too. <laughs> um, right? Yeah. Like, like there's all yeah. of these, these like elements towards no matter what future we envision, we're going to experience more disability, not less. So our continually, mm. the way in which we continually write out disability in all media, but also in, in how we regard the future, like really keeps us from confronting um, like, basic things we need to about how technologies work, right? And that they're not always yeah. constant, that we need maintenance, uh, that we that it takes a certain level of care and investment in infrastructure. I think about how all of these one-off devices where, oh, this is going to change everything for you, like only operates with certain like environmental considerations, right? And as soon as those break, um, 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 then, then things aren't going to go as well. I think about this a lot with like um, self-driving cars, right? Which of course we mm. want because we haven't invested in high-speed rail, um, right? Why do we need yeah. self-driving cars? It, we we failed at the other transport um, for lots of different social reasons. Um, um, but it's really hard to program these things because our roads are so irregular, right? Yeah. Our, our infrastructure itself makes all of these things that we think of about as sort of quicker technological projects are so much more complicated by the fact that we're not making crucial investments in basic infrastructure. Yeah. 
Well, and oh God, we, oh, sorry, we, we can't start talking about self-driving cars because then I will never shut up. I'm so excited uh, for you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's my it's my absolute favorite topic. Um, <laughs> but what what this reminds me of is a theme that we've come back on this show to again and again, which is that our sort of material technology in certain places has become very advanced. You know, the the iPhone is one of the most advanced pieces of technology in countless ways. Um, And yet our social technology, the technology of our society, how our democracy works, how we include people's voices and conversations, how we make uh, decisions as groups. Right. There's there's a way to define technology in my sort of naive view that includes like those processes as well. And that has not advanced, you know, our our so the 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 means by which we make decisions about how to build our society, about what material technologies to pursue, um, like that uh, that would mean, you know, an advance there would mean rooting out ableism and having a more inclusive way to talk to people. I don't know. Does that does that metaphor make sense to you at all? Yeah. I, you know, I think there's something to be said about paying attention to disability politics. Mm. Right. I think about the ways in which disabled groups, because we're all very different, um, have worked towards things like a cross difference, right, to get important pieces of legislation passed. And of course, if you had Judy Human here, you you might you might have, you might have run into some of the, these these concepts before. But the different types of like coalition building that exists in disability circles is really interesting because often it involves like confronting our own ableism about each other, right? Um, um, yeah. Because this is what we're this is the soup we're all stewing in. Um, um, that 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 um, we have all of these biases, but learning to like appreciate the contributions of other people um, and and see sort of like where we can work together, I think that's actually really important. I think having a disability politics um, is much more important to me than like having individual disabled people, right? We need to have an ethos of of making space for each other in terms of like setting up accessible experiences in every part of, of, of things. And it's not that all disabled people like agree all the time, uh, but, but there is a sense in which I'm going to provide the mechanism like to hear other people out. And and that yeah. that's a, like and sometimes that takes time. Like and I, I think about this, there's lots of theorizing about crypt time, right? About how sometimes mm. it takes disabled people longer or shorter times in some cases um to do particular tasks. Sometimes we don't show up on time um because we're we're dealing with um, you know, pain flares or something like that and how we can't work always at the same pace and it's just much like this concept give us, gives us some flexibility for thinking about how this is a much broader human experience, like that all yeah. like lots of other different types of disability share. Um, and I really like that sort of community theorizing um, that that happens. And I, I think cross cross community action is so important on on a lot of these things. Um, but actually, learning to listen to other people is a big part of that. Yeah, and I'm really grateful to you for the reminder that that's a community that I can participate in more fully myself, given my own, uh, uh, my own, as you say, multiple disabilities. Uh, you said you were to return to that. Yes. I'm curious what Let you me meant tell by that. You. Okay, so this is a thing I think about quite often because I'm at a research university. But most recruiting for research projects is about people having one disability and not others. Right. If you have criteria for for people that you would like to have as human subjects for different types of technology or scientific research, usually you want people who are in the absence of other disabilities, which means because most of us are multiply disabled, you and I both, um, 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 most disabled people are multiply disabled people. So most scientific research about disability actually doesn't represent most disabled people. Uh, um, there's this interesting like sort of inversion um, that sort of happens there, right? Where most people don't have just one, but when we're testing devices, we want people to have just one. I've started to think about right. like how to, how to address this problem in scientific research, um, especially about technology, but sort of in all areas because we, this, this is actually very bad because when, you know, when people announce their exoskeleton, they're like, well, this is for paraplegic people of this particular type of spinal cord injury. And you're like, well, that is a much smaller population than it was initially advertised as. I, uh, you know, I know we're so down on exoskeletons, but every time you say the word, 
I have picture an exoskeleton and I'm like, that's pretty fucking sick. Like it, they do look cool. <laughs> I mean, there is that. And, and I do think that that must be part of the desire to build them is like, you see the edge of tomorrow or some, some movie where some, someone's an exoskeleton. You're like, yeah, that's fucking sick. I want to, I, 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 <laughs> I mean, for, for, for me, ever since that one student pointed out the issue with the bathroom, I look at exoskeletons and I go, you won't be able to pull your pants down and sit on the toilet. <laughs> like it's much more, I, I guess, because I mean, one of the things I also have is Crohn's disease. So going to the bathroom is an important part of my life and it <laughs> oh needs to be my quick. God. <laughs> of course, of course it is. And that's, and that's the problem with, you know, science fiction leaving disability or even frankly bathrooms. Science, most science fiction doesn't have any bathrooms at all. Yeah. And no one's even thinking about, I mean, no one thinks about the fact that on Star Trek, they're all wearing jumpsuits. They're they're all having to un, unzip and pull, take all their clothes off to go to the bathroom. It's not Nobody convenient thinks technology. About it's not convenient technology for this, for sure. Um, <laughs> No, it's, there's, like, even, I don't know if you remember the show 24 that used to run. I, like, used to wait for someone to use the bathroom. Like, if they're going to show me a 24-hour period <laughs> and no one uses the bathroom, like, I feel like something's gone wrong for all of those people. I, I'm curious what a science fiction, you know, future that that does, you know, make space for disabled people. Like, what, is, what does that look like? Or do you have any, any you know, favorite thinkers who, who are envisioning that? Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, my colleague, Damian Williams, um, um, really got me excited about the show The Expanse, which really uh, does, yeah. which has like ideas about like how space will like affect human bodies in the long term. So you actually yes. see like once like Martians come back to Earth, like they can't like they can't stand up or get oriented. And it's like a not like because they're born under lower gravity. And they yeah. 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 So so I think there's some really like exciting science fiction, like when they do like admit that space will disable our bodies. Um, um, I, I think the expanse is really cool. Um, you know, there's some other like things about like genetic engineering. Um, Lewis Lois uh, Bujold has this one book where um like basically people who are supposed to go work off 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 site being uh, the site being earth um so people who need to go work in space actually like breeding them to have um four arms instead of two arms two legs because it's much more yes. convenient for pushing and moving around and doing the sort of tinkering tasks that they need to do um but then those pe like they're breeding them to be disabled but extra functional in a particular context it's an interesting idea too. Yeah, that's I I've I know that book and I've never read it, but it's such an interesting concept that yes, if you were born and and were working in free fall, you and you went up there with a body that you know had evolved for Earth's gravitation, you would be disabled vis-a-vis -vis free fall, and that you know the, you would actually uh, want a different body in that case. Well, coming back to uh, and bringing us in for a landing here, coming back to technology itself for. The person who is, you know, working in the technological field, right? I, I sort of imagine the 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 very capable high school student who's doing like the project. Uh, uh, you know, they're they're doing their oh, I'm I'm going to invent something project. They're like, oh, I want to help a disabled person by inventing some sort of thing to help people see or some sort of prosthetic limb. I feel like I saw this so much when I was a kid. Um, this the sort of Eagle Scout type project to to help disabled people. What is, uh, uh, we've talked about the mistakes that are being made by that person in that case. W how would you suggest that they correct that error? What is the, what is the step to take to uh, move us in a direction of, you know, thinking about technology in a way that is, is better? So Alice Wong talks about disabled people as oracles of the future. And mm. I think it's really important to listen to disabled people on future topics, but also on all sorts of technological topics. So I think like a first step, if you want to help disabled people, um, is essentially listening to disabled people. And sometimes that can mean picking up some poetry and memoir, right? That, that, that doesn't mm. necessarily look like you think it'll look. And I don't think you should like go out and find your first disabled person on like in the grocery store and start asking them questions. Don't do that. Um, right? well, I, I, I heard on this podcast that I should ask you questions. What do you need? How do I help you? Yeah, yeah, that's... yeah. yeah. I, I think there are much more organic, <laughs> less intrusive ways. I mean, a lot of disabled people are just expected to narrate their body for other people. And that's also kind of a terrible thing yeah. to have to do on a regular basis. 
you know, when people ask, what happened? What's wrong with you? Those are questions that disabled people who are visibly disabled um, get asked on a regular basis. And it's, you know, when I experience that, um, you know, and I say, well, I'm an amputee from cancer. Like their follow-up question is usually something like, but you're okay now, right? And I've had two recurrences of my cancer and two lung surgeries um, uh, related to those recurrences. So I don't feel super confident about saying like, oh yeah, everything's peachy keen now. Like I am someone whose body is surveilled um, medically and I want it to be, right? Um, um, you know, I, th- I, th- I think there are, um, you know, ways of, of asking these things without being intrusive or without like requiring someone to cheer you up about their disability, <laughs> which is which is often the ask. Um, but no, I think there are, I think disabled people's writing, um, I think the things that we make, um, you know, I'm, I'm really a fan of the, the sort of artistic work of Sins Invalid and so many of the poets and writers that come out of that group that are very um, like, um, proponents of disability justice. Um, I think those are really important artistic movements for disabled people that A, to pay attention to, uh, but also to learn from and having uh, community identity. Um, and, you know, I'd love to see more disabled characters written by disabled people, played by disabled people all over. Um, so I've been lucky. I've been having students come to my office all week to discuss like I have a long list of books written by disabled people and you can read any one of them or see like a list of documentaries or read these books of poetry. Like it's just a long list and they can come, you know, pick out one and come talk to me about it. And one of the books that they've been reading is this, it's called uh, One for All by uh, um, Lily Lanoff. Um, and it's uh, the, the author has pots, the main character has pots. Um, um, and it's it's a great book. It's not like totally centered on disability. There's a lovely story um, about her finding her dad's murderer. I don't know why I would call it a lovely story, but it's <laughs> it's a good story. Um, you know, it's and such it is, a sweet tale a sweet of finding tale a murderer, of avenging your finding father. the man who murdered your Oh, it's heartwarming. <laughs> no, this book sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's 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 a good book, right? It's a it's a young adult novel, uh, but the, it's like really good disability representation in a way that, you know, I can think of a couple of other novels that this is true for, um, but it's just really good to see. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on to talk to us about this. It's been a really mind and consciousness expanding conversation for me. And guess what? If people want to read work by a disabled person, they can check out your book Against Technoableism. How's that for a plug? Oh, I love it. Um, Thank you. And you can pick it up at our special bookshop, factuallypod.com slash books. Uh, But where else can people find the book and find your work, Ashley? I have a website called techanddisability.com, which Mm. will have some open access educational materials that'll come out in January um, that we're pretty excited about. That's basically a whole bunch of readings from disabled people. and that's pretty fun. But also, I mean, if you pick up the book or a reading guide about it, I want you to read other people's books, right? Um, um, so there are lots of things I reference, but then you can also um, um, you know, follow up with lots of different uh, memoir, poetry. Um, you know, I've mentioned Bill Peace's blog. It's fantastic. Um, there's, there's no dearth of this. Um, there's a lot uh, for people to check out. And that makes me really happy. Uh, That's so wonderful. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you once again to Ashley Shue for that incredible interview. If you want to pick up a copy of her book, you can get it at factuallypod.com slash books, where your purchase supports not just this show, but your local bookstore as well. If you want to support this show directly, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Five bucks a month gets you every episode of the show ad free. We even have a community discord, a lot of other great perks. $15 a month, I will read your name at the end of this podcast, and it'll go in the credits of every one of my video monologues. This week, I want to thank Busy B, Lois Bell, DPEJ, Ahmet A, and Monica Thompson. Thank you so much for your support. You make this show possible. I also want to thank my producers, Sam Roudman and Tony Wilson, everybody here at HeadGum who makes this show happen. You can find me online at Adam Conover, wherever you get your social media. Head to adamconover.net for my tickets and tour dates. Please come see me on the road in New York, Boston, Atlanta. Oh my God, I'm headed to San Francisco soon. Please come out and see me. Would love to see you there. Uh, And until then, we'll see you next time on Factually. That was a HeadGum podcast.